So I've wanted to share my hopes and fears for Rings of Power for a while now. Um, over the last couple years, I've shared a lot of these on live streams and breakdowns and videos like that, but I know not everybody watches those, even though you totally should, because they're delightful. And where else are you going to see John Rhys Davies read about the glittering caves in character as Gimli? And still the winding paths lead on into the mountain's heart. Anyway, I wanted to gather a lot of my thoughts about this series in a single video, and I wanted to do it when there was a bit more known and a bit less that was left to conjecture. I certainly felt like I had more to go on after the London event, but I wanted to wait until I could actually talk specifics about it. Thankfully, that day has finally come. So today on Nerd of the Rings, we're talking my hopes and fears for Rings of Power. Number one. A Game of Rings. One of the earliest rumors regarding Rings of Power was that they would take Tolkien's world and make it into a Game of Thrones clone, filled with gratuitous violence and nudity. I'll admit this was one of my earliest fears as well, though even then I thought it would be such a huge miscalculation that I doubted it would come to fruition. Fuel was further added to this fire with the news of the hiring of an intimacy coordinator. So much so that even today, despite its TV-14 rating, some folks still believe it will take the Game of Thrones route. This idea was directly shot down by J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay. Not only did they say they're looking to make a show that can be enjoyed by most of the family, but they took it a step further when talking with us to separate it from the doom and gloom of so many other shows we've seen. Just as Game of Thrones was in some ways the counter to the uplifting and hopefulness of the Peter Jackson films, it seems the showrunners believe the world is ready to once more dive into a story that focuses on hope rather than despair, and that focuses on heroes banding together rather than revel in the evils of human nature. They were so strong on this point that it would shock me if there was anything Game of Thronesy about this show. Keeping it clean gets a big, hopeful Gandalf thumbs up from me. Number two, time compression. Now we get to one of the biggest topics that I'm not sold on. This has been covered a bit elsewhere, but Payne and McKay again indicated that they felt it was better to condense the timeline to overcome the need to cast new human characters every season. They seem confident that they'll be able to appropriately convey the mortality versus immortality issue that lies at the heart of the Second Age. Personally, I'm still really skeptical about this one. The idea that characters like Gil-galad, Elrond, and Galadriel live on while generations of men come and go explains so much of what happens with Numenor. And the fact that the elves linger while the world grows old explains why Sauron is able to dupe them with the whole Rings of Power scheme. I think that rather than condensing it to a single human life, it would have been far more impactful to see a montage of funerals for Numenorean kings, as their heirs look on, increasingly bitter over their perceived curse of mortality. And to have the show take place over, say, three Numenorean lifetimes instead of one, and I'm not really buying the idea that it would be too great of a hurdle to cast new humans every season or two. That in itself would give some extra casting excitement between seasons, and it's not like this show is hurting for budget to hire more actors. I'm sure I could talk about time compression for an hour, but for the sake of brevity, let's just say I'm going in unconvinced. So time compression will remain a fear and get a scary Bilbo. Number three, politics. While nudity and gratuitous violence were my earliest concerns, I'd say my biggest was that the creators of this show would feel the need to make some kind of commentary on our modern times through the vessel of a Tolkien adaptation. As I've said multiple times here on the channel, the great thing about Middle-earth tales is that their stories are timeless and their themes are universal. And I was pleasantly surprised to hear Patrick McKay say nearly these exact words while saying outright that they were not out to make this show political. Now, I suppose the caveat here would be what people define as political could be different. Personally, I would hate it if there was some allegory made in the show tying it to something or someone from recent history. For example, if I were to ever hear one of these guys say Ar Farazan or Sauron is like the insert political candidate of Middle-earth, that would be a big red flag for me. 
For now, I'm willing to take them at their word that this show has its sights set on Tolkien's themes and allowing the viewer to escape into Middle-earth rather than reminding us of the world we're looking to escape from. I feel it's also worth mentioning that I've noticed a ton of people taking things they've read online, be it the opinions of journalists, fans, or people who've been erroneously connected to the show, and conflating those with the show itself. Personally, when I see a new article or post of some kind, I tend to look for the quotes of people actually involved with the show and take the rest with a grain of salt. I know it's a lot of work in the age of sound bites and grabby headlines, but I think it might give us a more accurate picture of what's in store. The promise of keeping Middle Earth timeless and universal gets a big ol' thumbs up Gandalf. Let's hope it stays that way. Durin's is, is folk. In her Q&A with the showrunners, McKay made a point to say how much they loved the dwarves, and that they really sought to do the dwarves justice. Personally, my biggest complaint regarding previous adaptations of dwarves is lack of development in the later Hobbit films. But for those who maybe aren't as fond of the amount of comic relief they've been used for in the past, it might be welcome news that they seem keen to dive deep into the dwarves as a race and do them justice. That being said, I also have hesitancy about their translation to screen in this adaptation. Piggybacking off the time compression topic, we've known for a while that Durin IV, who we've seen in images, is the son of Durin III. I made a rather big deal of this in one of my earlier breakdowns, pointing out that the name Durin wasn't just some common name to be passed down from father to son. Durin is only given as a name when it's believed the original Durin has been reincarnated to lead his people once more. The idea that we could have Durin III and Durin IV at the same time is so very odd to me. And while the showrunners did acknowledge this very concern in talking with us, and they assured us they had a plan in place to make this make sense, I can't help but be skeptical. I really love hearing the people making the show are big fans of the dwarves and want to do right by them but I'm struggling to see how they'll make this simultaneous Durin's make sense in a way that I won't feel misses the mark. I'm super pumped to see Kaza Doom and love hearing the Dwarven race will get special attention, but the simultaneous Durin's is a hard pill to swallow. I feel split on this one and I gotta see it play out before knowing how I feel. So we'll call it a Gandabo or a Bildolf. This one's up in the air. Number five, John Howe. The next two points kind of go hand in hand. By now you may have heard that at the London event we met and spoke with not just the showrunners but also artist John Howe, one of what I consider the holy trinity of Tolkien artists. We got a sneak peek at the recently released Snow Troll concept art as well as a few other pieces that looked every bit as incredible as you would expect from a master such as Howe. There's not a whole lot else to say here to be honest. Whether the story soars, falls flat, or lies somewhere in between, if Rings of Power succeeds in translating John Howe's concept art, this show should look like Middle Earth. Anytime you start with John Howe concept art, you've got a solid foundation. Gandalf's all around. Number six, the look. Another concern I shared on a previous stream was that the world would look too clean and that they wouldn't capture that lived in feel that Peter Jackson's films did so incredibly well. It's kind of a staple of generic fantasy that the costumes look very bland without much detail. Wheel of Time was a recent show that gave me some of this same feeling, like some of the outfits could be found in a random shop. As for the rest of that show, I can't even begin to comment on it as an adaptation as I've never read the books. My Wheel of Time friends lost me when they said I would just have to power through like three to four books, not chapters, push through entire freaking books. I think I'll just reread Children of Horan. Anyway, back to the look of this show. In London, we actually got to see three costumes up close. Galadriel's, Durin the Fourth's, and Arondir's. These costumes had a tremendous amount of detail and definitely didn't look too clean. There were scuffs and scratches where appropriate and intricate designs that would have looked perfectly at home with Weta's incredible work for the Jackson films. While I can't say yet what we saw in the scenes we were shown, I can say that it definitely did not look like generic fantasy. This, along with the John Howe work, leads me to believe that if there are problems to be had with this show, they should not come from the visuals. Another Gandalf. Number 7. Harfoots. 
So if you've been around the channel for a while, you may recall in some of my earliest live streams my feelings on hobbits in the Second Age. In short, I'm not a huge fan of the idea. My fear is that they'll be used too much, have too big a part to play in the story, and be used as a crutch to have accessible characters for the audience. I actually did an entire video on why Elrond would be a great character to focus on, in part due to the fact that hobbits aren't in the recorded history of the Second Age. And also because Elrond's awesome, and has the most compelling storyline that spans across three ages. The thing with hobbits is that they're interesting and heroic in the Third Age, in part because they've historically never been involved in great tales and battles. With overuse, the unlikely heroes become all too likely. So the only way that I can see their storyline play out in a satisfying way is that they're either a very minor part of the story, they're completely disconnected from the elves, dwarves, and men of Middle-earth, or nearly this entire group is brutally slaughtered by Sauron and wiped from the pages of history. Actually, that third option might be pretty legit. It's dark, but legit. Look, there's some folks who are excited to see Hobbits again, and that's fine. I'm not about to tell people what they should and shouldn't be excited for. Everyone should fan how they want to fan without fearing ridicule from others. For my part, the best I can say is I'm totally apathetic in regards to the Harfoots at this point. Scary Bilbo all the way until I'm given a reason to care about Harfoots. Number eight, showrunners. So judging by some of the comments, using the term showrunners can be triggering, as the kids say nowadays, but I really don't know what else to call J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay. It's their actual job title, and it's not even an uncommon one, so that's what I'm going with. Alongside my concern that the Rings of Power would be similar to Game of Thrones was who would be in charge of this thing. Who would be tasked with translating Tolkien's second age to screen, and would they care enough about Tolkien to have him in mind when crafting this world? Even after they were announced, I couldn't say whether I felt comforted or more hesitant because Payne and McKay are a relatively unknown quantity. Just as it would have been hugely disingenuous for me to come back from the sneak peek telling you all that this show is guaranteed to be great, it would have been hugely disingenuous for me to pretend I wasn't pleasantly surprised and impressed with Payne and McKay. Far more than any footage we were shown, it was speaking with them that allowed my nerdy heart to have any true optimism toward the show. While I was curious to hear what they had to say about their show, I was even more interested in how they responded to questions from the group. Canned responses and rehearsed Tolkien quotes are a dime a dozen, but I wanted to hear if they could do so when responding to very specific questions about the lore and Tolkien's themes. To their credit, they were able to do just that. They referenced specific Tolkien letters and passages from the History of Middle-earth volumes in some of their responses that I don't think could have been wholly rehearsed. Whatever my hesitancy at the beginning, I don't question that they do genuinely care about the author and his works. The big question I now have is can they put their money where their mouth is? As I said in my London video, all the passion and knowledge in the world is worthless without execution. A quote which I now can say came directly from a conversation I had with Patrick McKay. He knows full well that they've got to bring the goods, and seems confident that they have. While I'm still hesitant on a fair amount of things that I'm covering in this video, I'm willing to be proven wrong. So if Harfoots are the greatest thing since sliced Limbus, I'll admit it. I doubt I'll have to, but I'm not about to write off an entire show that I haven't seen a single episode of. To me, that just seems hasty. What wouldn't be hasty is getting Payne and McKay in front of a camera for a proper interview, where their vision can be presented to fans. Why they've only had a handful of quotes in print publications and nothing on camera is beyond me. It hasn't been enough to give fans on the fence any kind of faith. And every day they go without putting the showrunners on camera and allowing them to talk to fans is a misstep in my mind. The showrunners get a hopeful Gandalf from me, only because I've had the opportunity to see and hear them for myself. Here's hoping Amazon wisens up and allows all fans to hear them soon. Number nine, canon and non-canon. Obviously, there's been a good amount of skepticism toward this show, and rightfully so. As you can imagine, I feel the marketing has leaned way too much on original characters and storylines, to the point where I have a Jeff Goldblum meme waiting in the wings. I hope I don't have to use it, but you gotta admit, it's a pretty good meme. 
As soon as this show was announced to be covering the second age, I knew there would be a good amount of original story that would have to be created to fill the gaps, give character development, and add weight to the bullet points and summaries we have from the appendices. Anyone expecting a show with nothing original was either kidding themselves or just completely unfamiliar with the source material. There's certainly a balance here, and I just hope that the focus remains on the characters we actually know. I want to see the stories of Elrond, Galadriel, Gil-galad, Celebrimbor, Círdan, Elendil, Isildur, Arpharazon, and Sauron. And I just don't think I'm going to have a whole lot of patience if their stories that we know are made to take a back seat to original ones. Payne and McKay told us there's a good amount of laying the foundation in this first season to not only show how Sauron is able to manipulate elves and men, but also what is at stake should he succeed in his plans against these realms. I can totally understand that you aren't going to start episode one with the forging of the rings, but after two trilogies leading with really effective and succinct prologues, one of which being the greatest of all time in my opinion, I hope we aren't going to have to wait too long to get to the good stuff that we're all here for. Until proven otherwise, this is going to sit at a scary Bilbo. The ratio of everything we've seen has been too heavily non-canon for my taste but I'm hoping it's because they're saving the big canon stuff to be revealed in the show itself. Number 10, canon moments. Speaking of what will be in the show, it should go without saying and without too much explanation that I'm dying to see big canon moments. And my hopes are sky high for the creation of the Rings of Power, the War of the Elves and Sauron, the Sack of Eregion, the founding of Rivendell, the Battle of the Gwathlo, the humbling of Sauron, Isildur and the Fruit of Nimloth, the Fall of Numenor, the founding of Gondor and Arnor, the first sack of Minas Ithil, the last alliance of Elves and Men, the face-off of Elendil and Gilgalad with Sauron, and the Dark Lord's downfall, and that's just off the top of my head. This is basically just a list of Tolkien moments that we should certainly see. So it obviously gets my hopes up. Number 11. Galadriel. As I said in my breakdown of the first teaser, my biggest fear with Galadriel was that they'd turn her into a generic warrior princess type character. And so far, we've almost exclusively seen Galadriel in warrior mode. This was another topic discussed with Payne and McKay, and while they didn't give too many specifics, charting a course for Galadriel to grow from headstrong and prideful into the ethereal Lady of Lorien seemed to be a major concentration. Now, I don't know for sure, but I think reading between the lines that Celeborn, who I was assured will not be ignored, and perhaps their daughter Celebrion, will play a part in Galadriel letting go of her pride. Personally, I don't have any real problems with Galadriel being portrayed as a warrior or a hothead. I mean, we're told she left Valinor with the rest of the Noldor, in part out of spite for Feanor, thinking she would thwart him however she could in Middle-earth. Which, if you're not a Feanor sympathizer, is pretty awesome. What I'll be looking for with Galadriel is that her character doesn't both start and end with her being a hot-headed warrior, and that the all-too-common trope of girl main character needs to look awesome, so we must make guy main character look dumb. Galadriel is awesome, end of story. Gilgalad and Elrond are also awesome, end of story. If anyone needs to look inept for Galadriel's sake, it should be Celebrimbor when it comes to Anatar because we know that Galadriel was alone in his realm in not trusting Sauron's fair form. I've gotten my hopes up for big things and a big character arc for Galadriel, so she's sitting at a hopeful Gandalf. Number 12, marketing. Since we touched on marketing earlier, I should say I think it's honestly been one of the biggest drawbacks of the series thus far. In my opinion, it's been focused way too much on original characters. Aside from Galadriel, we've gotten shockingly little to show of canon characters. It's simply not been enough to get a lot of book fans excited. While there were things in the footage I saw to indicate that there'll be more canon lore and references than you might expect, that's stuff that hasn't come through in the marketing. And okay, since we're getting things out on the table, let's talk briefly about the whole superfans thing. I didn't address this earlier because it truly doesn't have anything to do with the show itself, and I'd much rather talk about lore-related topics. But since we're talking about how marketing has affected this series, we can't ignore it. Like the vast majority of folks, I thought the whole promo was incredibly disingenuous. If they had simply titled it, Random Folks React to the Teaser, I would have thought, okay, cool. These people don't know their lore, but whatever, they're random folks. 
Now, this is just my theory, and it's not based on any conversations with people who would know, but I feel like the London event was a direct response to the Superfans incident. It came across to me like they said, hey, pretty much everyone hated this Superfans thing, and says we should have invited people who know their Tolkien instead. And I think that's what they aim to do in London. Now, it could be seen as too little too late for some, and I understand that. And it can be seen as a marketing ploy, which, yeah, of course it is. But I gotta level with you guys on this because I know there are some who are genuinely concerned about it. A huge part of the reason I had any optimism leaving that event was because what I saw and heard didn't jive with the marketing I've seen. Which leads me to believe that either A, the marketing has had some massive miscalculations on how Tolkien fans would react to what they're focusing on, or B, what we heard in London isn't accurate to the truth of the show. I want to believe it's option A, and that the marketing just hasn't spoken to Tolkien fans in a way the show will set out to do. But we'll only know for sure when the show comes out. Like I've said since starting this channel two years ago, I'm going to give the show a shot to wow me. Because the best case scenario is that I get to escape back to the fantasy world I know and love, and the worst case scenario is the show is a disappointment. In which case, I'll wash the taste out of my mouth by reading the text, or playing Lotro, or watching the Lord of the Rings films. Then I'll probably make a video on how I think the show should have been done differently. The marketing to date gets a scary Bilbo. Conclusion At the end of the day, this is just one adaptation. And not even the only one on the horizon. When the show comes out, I'm always going to keep it real with you guys and tell you what I think works and what I think doesn't. I'm not beholden to Amazon in any way, shape, or form. I'm beholden to you guys. You guys are the viewers who have made Nerd of the Rings what it is today. If I felt like the London thing would have compromised my ability to be honest with you guys, I wouldn't have done it. So feel free to fire away anytime in the live chat or comments if you want to hear my thoughts on a Tolkien-related topic or want further clarifications about the things I say about the show. I'm going to talk about this show from time to time because we're a Tolkien channel. And I think there's a lot of fun to be had in talking about adaptations as they play out. No matter what the topic though, I'll always have my eye on Tolkien's lore and his themes. Because that's where the magic truly lies. And whether it's Rings of Power, War of the Rohirrim, the Gollum game, or any other adaptation I'm doing videos on, it'll always be in addition to and not in place of my weekly lore videos that you guys have grown to love. So along the way, we'll do some breakdowns, maybe some watch parties, stuff like that, where we can chat about how awesome Numenor looks or who might be Anatar in disguise or why the Harfoots are taking up so much screen time or why a guy would come from a meteor to Middle Earth and I haven't even talked about Meteor Man. I've made it all the way into this video and I haven't even mentioned Meteor Man. All right, we're going to have to save that for another video because this is already long enough. But hey, shout out to Fellowship of Fans because they came up with the name Meteor Man. And I doubt that Amazon really loves that name, but that nickname's not going anywhere. That guy's forever Meteor Man now. In closing, I'll just reiterate, I'm not about to tell anyone how to fan. With any adaptation, you can love it, you can hate it, you can stand anywhere in between. And just as I'd say, don't feel you need to change your opinion to suit others, don't demand someone else to change their opinion to suit yours. There's been far too many insults and labels thrown around at people for being either optimistic or pessimistic about this show. And at this point, it's all just noise that I have very little interest in. I've found a hallmark of Tolkien fandom is our ability to disagree vehemently, but respectfully. Just as we've done for decades regarding Balrog Wings and Orodreth's parentage, I think we can discuss the merits and pitfalls of this show with respect. Thanks for sticking around this far into the video. I know it's been a long one. Here's some rapid fire nuggets as a reward. Robert Arameo, who plays Elrond, was said to be the biggest Tolkien nerd on set. Elrond is my favorite Second Age character, so I'm pumped to hear this. And Arameo is now officially number one on my interview list if I ever interview anyone from the show. This statue in Numenor? Totally Arendil. Boom. Silmaril, right there. This is the best option for this statue, and I'll probably explain why in a later video. I think I know exactly what the deal is with this sword, but I'm going to save that for a theory video because it's a bit out there. Well, thanks again so much for watching, guys. I'm really curious if some of my fears are maybe your hopes or my hopes are your fears, so definitely let me know in the comments. I really want to hear from you guys. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. 
Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.